You know, with all the shit that's been rightfully slung at the scumbags of Kathleen Kennedy's cabinet of cucks helming the Star Wars franchise at Disney Lucasfilm, the last thing I expected in 2021 was to see OG Marsha Lucas herself, ex-wife of Star Wars creator and visionary George Lucas, come out and say that the Disney Star Wars sequel trilogy was an insulting pile of dog crap. Alright. I'm paraphrasing there, but we're going to get into it. Welcome back to the channel, everyone. It's your pal Noms here. And today we're going to have a bit of fun going through some incredibly unfiltered and damning quotes by Marsha Lucas directed at Disney Lucasfilm and explicitly their higher-ups and creative directors. Of course, Marsha Lucas was one of the editors who worked on the original Star Wars movie back in 1977. You'll notice I didn't use the term saved, quote-unquote, as so many dumbasses on the internet like to ignorantly regurgitate. But we will get back to that. However, Marsha did work and contribute substantially to the editing of the original Star Wars film and probably worked closer with George Lucas than anyone given the fact that they were husband and wife at the time. This fact is important because, well, since the purchase of Lucasfilm by Disney back in 2012, George Lucas's true feelings on the Star Wars sequels and on the direction that his beloved franchise was taken have been, well, legally handcuffed. Disney slapped him with a non-disparagement agreement as soon as the ink touched the paper on his contract when he signed his company over, meaning that George Lucas can't speak out explicitly negative about the company or the IP they now own, no matter what they choose to do with it. The closest we got to seeing George Lucas rightfully throw Disney and their corporates under the bus for how they treated him and his creation was back in 2015 in a now very infamous Charlie Rose interview where George referred to Disney as the quote-unquote white slavers, and he basically implied that Disney are an evil corporation that buys up properties and abuses the integrity of those properties they appropriate from other artists, which, given their track record, yeah, I'd say that sums it up right. They decided they didn't want to use those stories. They decided they were going to go do their own thing, and so I decided, fine. But basically, I'm not going to try to... They weren't that keen to have me involved anyway, but at the same time, I said, I'm not going to... If I get in there, I'm just going to cause trouble because they're not going to do what I want them to do. So, And I don't have the control to do that anymore, and all I would do is muck everything up. So I said, okay... I will go my way and I'll let them go their way. And it really does come down to a, a simple rule of life, which is when you break up with somebody, the first rule is no phone calls. The second rule, you don't go over to their house and drive by to see what they're doing. The third one is you don't show up at their coffee shop or the things that you're going to run it. You just say, no, gone, history, I'm moving forward. Because every time you do, and you know, we all learn this from experience. Every time you do something like that, you're opening the wound again. And it just makes it harder for you. You have to put it behind you. And it's a very, very, very hard thing to do. But you have to just cut it off and say, okay, end the ballgame. i got to move on. And everything in your body says, don't, you can't. And these are my kids. So All those Star Wars films. All the Star Wars films. They were your kids. Yeah, well, they are. Right. You know, I, I loved them. I created them. Um, I'm very intimately involved in them, and obviously to and sell you them sold off them. To, I sold them to the white slavers that take these things and and. Uh, <laughs> okay, but but I mean, but but having said all that, and having. Now again, I'm reading between the lines with that one because as you can see in the interview, George cut his remarks short. But given Disney's track record, yeah. I'd say that sums him up just about perfectly. Now, apparently that white slaver's comment got him into a lot of trouble behind the scenes, which is why we've scarcely heard anything negative from George regarding Disney or the direction they've taken Star Wars in the time since. Disney are about as cold-blooded and legally ruthless as it gets, they have no shame, and this non-disparagement stuff is probably written into every contract of every production staff member, executive, actor, or hell, even the sanitation workers they have on their payroll. What was your job when you were based here? Sanitation. Sanitation. One famous example of legally swearing one of their staff members to silence is the late, great J.W. Rinsler, one of the most notable authors on the behind-the-scenes production of Star Wars. He famously wrote The Making of Star Wars, which is probably the most informative piece of behind-the-scenes media a person can find on the production of the original Star Wars movie. And in doing so, he worked extremely close with George Lucas. In an interview with Rick Worley, J.W. Rinsler was incredibly open about his experience about working with Lucas regarding the original six Star Wars movies, but 
Rinsler was legally obligated to not have any comment about his experiences working with J.J. Abrams behind the scenes on the making of The Force Awakens, because that production was owned by Disney. Last year, while promoting his newly written novel, All Up, J.W. Rinsler on his own YouTube channel, spoke about the NDA and how he was prevented from discussing his work regarding the making of The Force Awakens and why his novel was cancelled by Disney. And according to Rinsler himself, there was nothing at all damning about the company in the book, nothing disparaging whatsoever. He simply gave an accurate account of what happened behind the scenes that made the production seem less than perfect. Now, I know some people have tuned in, so to speak, uh, to hear about uh, my experiences at Lucasfilm uh, as Disney, you know, took over what they had bought. And I, you know, and I really can't talk too much about that because of this NDA, which I've tweeted about. Uh, I don't want my family to end up in debtor's prison. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, so I want to manage expectations. I can't, I, you know, have to do weird syntax and talk about things in a kind of roundabout way. Um, but I will talk a little bit about that. And, uh, but I just don't want people to think I can say what actually happened because I can't still, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I, I, to me, an NDA should be covering things that are going to damage the company in terms of like giving away a plot point of a movie that's not been released or financials or something that's really secret. Nothing that I was going to do was, talk about was like that. I, I, I consider myself more of just somebody who wanted to say what was going on in a, in a general way. Well, I guess in some specifics, but nothing that was going to damage the financial bottom line, really. Uh, I think the NDAs as they're written now are too broad. And I, I think that it's something that needs to be looked into on a more general level. I think people who join companies are asked to sign NDAs that are too all-encompassing. But that's just me, and I'm going off on a tangent. But I went to my agent, and I said, what should I do? And he said, take down the blog right away. <laughs> he said, if you try and fight it, just step one will end up costing you at least $20,000. And I don't have that kind of money to throw around. So it's a good thing there was at least one person who was close to Lucas during the production of the original Star Wars who Disney couldn't legally handcuff, Marsha Lucas. Speaking of J.W. Rinsler, these disparaging comments on the Disney Star Wars trilogy are referenced from his book on Howard Kazanjian, and coincidentally, Rick's interview with Rinsler took place shortly after he interviewed Marsha, so we're going to come back to it towards the end of the video, because Marsha also debunks another anti-George Lucas narrative that some online personalities have implicated her in, and in the interview, Rinsler also comments on that. That's actually one of the, because uh, I know that you just interviewed Marsha Lucas, which is a kind of a big deal, because she doesn't really do interviews. Um, with a lot of the people that don't like the prequels, the, the, their ideas that... Um, you know, anything that they do like about the originals, they say that somebody else did it. It was Lawrence Kasdan or Urban Kirshner, you know, and they don't give credit Lucas, George Lucas credit for any of the stuff that they actually like. And I've seen a lot recently this idea that Marsha Lucas saved the movies. And I mean, I'm sure that she contributed quite a lot. I'm sure she did important things. But a lot of the fans that are saying this, I don't think have any idea exactly what she did. I was wondering if you could talk about, um, you know, specific things that she worked on. Do you have a very clear idea? But for now, here is what Marshall Lucas had to say about the direction of Star Wars under Disney Lucasfilm, and this chick did not mince words. She says, I like Kathleen. I always liked her. She was full of beans. She was really smart and really bright. Really wonderful woman. And I liked her husband, Frank, as well. I liked them a lot. Now that she's running Lucasfilm and making movies, it seems to me that Kathy Kennedy and J.J. Abrams don't have a clue about Star Wars. Owie! They don't get it? And J.J. Abrams is writing these stories? When I saw that movie where they killed Han Solo, I was furious when they killed Han Solo. <laughs> Absolutely, positively, there was no rhyme or reason to it. Can you feel that? Huh? Can you feel it, Captain Compost? I thought, you don't get the Jedi story. You don't get the magic of Star Wars. You're getting rid of Han Solo. And then at the end of this last one, The Last Jedi, they have Luke disintegrate. They killed Han Solo. They killed Luke Skywalker. And they don't have Princess Leia anymore. Breathe. 
<laughs> and they're spitting out movies every year. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> well, not so much anymore, but let's continue. And they think it's important to appeal to a woman's audience, so now their main character is this female who's supposed to have Jedi powers, but we don't know how she got the Jedi powers or who she is. It sucks. Oh my god. <laughs> Ah. Wow, Marsha. The storylines are terrible. Just terrible. Awful. Jordan fades back. Swoosh. And that's the game! You can quote me. J.J. Abrams, Kathy Kennedy, talk to me. And that's the way the cookie crumbles. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh, wow. Doesn't get any more clear cut and dry than that. It's in writing and she didn't hold back an inch. Bravo, Marsha. Bra fucking vo. Tell us how you really feel there, Marsha. She didn't just criticize Disney openly. She put them through a fucking meat grinder and named exactly who she was displeased with in a manner that I don't think we've seen from someone who was as involved with Star Wars as she was once upon a time. I mean, John Boyega has criticized Lucasfilm for making token characters that were underutilized, including but not limited to the character he played. And also, let's not forget how Daisy Ridley dropped a bombshell last year, confirming what we all pretty much already knew about the production of the Disney sequels that J.J. Abrams, Kathleen Kennedy, and Ryan Johnson had zero roadmap whatsoever for those movies. But neither of them actually came out and explicitly badmouthed the creative team and executives or explicitly called the movies awful the way Marsha did. What I love most about what Marsha said, besides the fact that she wasn't vague, is not only did she condemn the mistreatment of legacy characters like Han Solo and Luke Skywalker and how insulting their depiction was in those movies under this new creative regime, but she also, and arguably most importantly, criticized the agenda of the movies for trying to appeal to a woman's audience when Star Wars is meant for everybody. And she also goes on about how the movies completely fuck up the lore of the Force and the Jedi by cooking up a random female Jedi who can, without any plausible reason whatsoever, use the Force in a manner that dwarfs just about any other Jedi character that came before her without any training at all. A character who can do everything. A Mary Sue character that... The majority of fans couldn't stand because of how unrelatable she was. Of course, I'm paraphrasing here, but but see, the fans who couldn't stand this Mary Sue character, and rightfully so, were labeled. They were labeled as misogynistic, unreasonable man babies. So the fact that Marsha, Marsha Lucas' ex-wife, female ex-wife of George Lucas couldn't stand her either, completely shatters that narrative. And the fact that she's a former OG production member, and again, ex-wife of the creator of the franchise, makes her stance so cathartic. Because we've been criticizing this company and its shitty movies for years, and they try to drown us out, but they can't ignore her. And thankfully, they can't control her. Marsha Lucas rarely gives interviews, so I guess that's why her stance on the matter took so long to be heard. But you see, this also gave Marsha the chance to debunk another narrative. And while I've seen so many content creators talk about how she bashed Disney, I haven't seen much of the internet highlighting the other stuff that Marsha said that completely shatters another narrative surrounding her ex-husband, the creator of Star Wars, George Lucas. The internet has often used the crutch of, quote, Star Wars was saved in the edit, end quote, to avoid praising George Lucas for his past work, and this is mainly due to the wave of prequel hate bandwagoners that occupied the internet in its early days. I mean, the original Star Wars, I thought they were... I mean, they were pretty well-directed films, you know? They were well-edited films. Well, that's, yeah, there's a lot so, of talk about, about Star Wars and how it was sort of saved and edited yeah. and everything they changed, but... Right. <laughs> like, people say the original cut of Star Wars was very, like, like not paced out well. Yeah. It didn't have yeah. a lot of oomph to it. And then those guys went and edited it, and they're like, yes, okay, we have to make these scenes work. We have to... So I, I, I propose he's fraud from the, the get-go. From the very beginning, you know? And Marsha Lucas was often labeled as some kind of savior of the project. People desperate to sell this narrative treat her as like some kind of martyr. Now, I'd like to think most everyone with more than two functioning brain cells would know that this narrative was full of shit right from the very get-go. Since virtually every unanimously praised piece of media, be it a novel, comic, or film, is saved in the edit. 
That's why these things called drafts and rough cuts exist. In regards to, quote, saving Star Wars in the edit, here's what Marsha Lucas had to say. From the same novel, it says, Marsha has heard many times that George was the head and she was the heart of Star Wars. But she says that's not accurate. Quote, I wouldn't think so. Marsha says, I definitely made scenes work. I made the end battle work. I definitely had a lot to do with making it work, but I wasn't the writer and I wasn't the director. And I didn't come up with the creative names, Darth Vader, Luke Skywalker. All those names are classics. George came up with all of it using his amazing imagination. And the truth shall set you free. And funnily enough, J.W. Rinsler was asked about this during Rick Wally's interview, and here's what he had to say. And I've seen a lot recently this idea that Marsha Lucas saved the movies. And I mean, I'm sure that she contributed quite a lot. I'm sure she did important things. But a lot of the fans that are saying this, I don't think have any idea exactly what she did. I was wondering if you could talk about, um, you know, specific things that she worked on. Do you have a very clear idea? I have a pretty clear idea. Yeah, we talked, spoke for a while, and I, you know, and I spoke with George about it before. Uh, you know, without uh, scooping the book, uh, because we do want people eventually to read the the Howard. It's basically you know a book about Howard Kazanjian, but her Marsha Lucas's interviews featured throughout the the book, and in more some places more than others, of for you know obvious reasons. But I think she was just there as as a person who had strong opinions about uh, certain elements of the film, and uh, and you know, for instance, American Graffiti uh, fought pretty hard for editing it in a certain way at a certain juncture when the movie wasn't quite working. Yeah, and uh, that was really key. And uh, she she was good at. Uh, I think Dwayne Dunham told me this, uh, who's also an editor and director, that she was really good at doing the emotional character scenes. <clears throat> it's not that she did all of them, but she was able to look at them and sometimes change something very small and it really made it work. And uh, <clears throat> she was just, you know, she George, of course, is a fantastic editor. I mean, he's really yeah. a great editor. And Marsha Lucas is a really great editor. And... So the two of them together, particularly on Star Wars and Empire, I mean, that's a it's not like the other editors weren't doing anything, but that that's a good those are two really fantastic uh editors working on a film. Uh although, you know, of course George was clearly the one who just had the final say on everything. Right. But but Marsh is the one and and George has said this too, that that edited together, you know basically the uh, the f attack on the death star which is one of the most incredible pieces of editing in the history of film but then he was also there too so he has to get credit as well and marcia was you know wasn't marcia certainly wasn't saying anything like now i want credit damn it no she was just she doesn't like giving interviews she thinks george deserves all the credit um but she did do a few things and and right. so she was talking about those things I definitely recommend heading over to Rick's channel and watching that interview in its entirety because it's very informative about the conversation that Rinsler had with Marsha Lucas regarding his novel about Howard Kazanjian. But if you're looking for an excellent beat-for-beat -beat breakdown for why Star Wars was saved in the edit by Marsha Lucas was a trash narrative by the internet from the get-go, more specifically referencing Rocket Jump's infamous video, then you should really check out Nerdonymous's video, where he basically debunks the whole thing through a fuck ton of time and effort researching first-hand accounts, including the works of, you guessed it, J.W. Rinsler, regarding the behind-the-scenes production on the original Star Wars movie. Without giving away the whole video, he basically reveals that Rocket Jump deliberately excluded context from the quotes he used in his video that would have acted as a brick wall for his narrative against George Lucas. Nerdonymous also shows that Rocket Jump was either dishonest or straight up ignorant about the sequence of events that transpired during the making of Star Wars and who contributed what to the film and Nerdonymous goes on to prove that ultimately it was George that had the final say and influence on the finished cut that everyone praises. It's an excellent video, a breath of fresh air I'd assume for many of you and I highly suggest you check it out. I've linked Rick Worley and Nerdonymous's channels below so you can go and check out their content. But let's get back on point. 
Marsha Lucas' words are clearly straight from the heart and likely express what many who worked on the original Star Wars, including George, think of these new movies. If Marsha Lucas is this pissed off at the creative leads at Lucasfilm, just imagine how pissed off George Lucas must be. It's just a damn shame he can't say it because he would get crucified by the legal system. But Marsha was under no such contract, and it's a shame she doesn't like to give interviews because I'm sure fans of the franchise would have loved to hear her perspective much, much sooner. But I suppose it's better late than never. It's the same reason why the Star Wars was saved in the edit narrative remains so prevalent over the past decade. Though again, I'd like to think most people who thought about that for more than two seconds realized it was bogus to begin with. But there you have it. Thank you, Marsha, for expressing your opinion on the new owners of Star Wars and your first-hand account on the movie that made us all fall in love with the franchise to begin with. Before I wrap this up, and since I know I'll likely be asked in the comments, what do I think of Marsha Lucas saying she wasn't a fan of the prequels? Honestly, I'm quite indifferent about it. After giving her comments a look, it's not a take I haven't seen a zillion times before. It's just a lot of surface level stuff that's not quite accurate. For example, Marsha wasn't a fan of Anakin being a little boy and the fact that Padme was older than him. She also gets the ages wrong with each character, and if I didn't know any better from reading what she had to say, I'd think Marsha was under the impression that Padme was infatuated with Anakin in The Phantom Menace, which also isn't accurate. Because it's a huge point in Attack of the Clones that Padme becomes attracted to Anakin when he re-emerges in her life as an adult. And Marsha also goes on about the prevalence of CGI extravagance in Episode 1, which is another form of common misconception since the practical effects in The Phantom Menace actually dwarfed the amount of CGI in that movie and also dwarfed the amount of practical effects in any other Star Wars movie up to that point. But the fact of the matter is, Marsha Lucas, for whatever her reasons, didn't like the story and felt disappointed with what George decided to do, and that's absolutely fine. More power to her. As good as the prequels are, they don't resonate with everyone, and neither does Star Wars as a whole. Anyway guys, that about wraps it up for today. Thank you very much for checking out this video. I really appreciate it. Please don't forget to check out the channels and content I mentioned regarding J.W. Rinsler's interview and Marshall Lucas's comments. Also, a special thank you to A British Potato for helping me edit the audio for this video. Check out his channel. He makes great stuff. I've linked it below in the description. Anyway guys, thanks for staying to the end of the video. You are a legend and I'll see you next time.